So we'll get back at it. So the time between when we read together at breakfast and when we read together at lunch is when I do one-on-one -on -one work with my kids. And it's short and efficient. So the most amount of kids I ever had homeschooling at the same time, meaning some were preschoolers and some were, or, or some were finished school, was five, okay? So those five kids I would just take turns with, you know, or four kids or however many I would take turns with throughout the morning. I had the odd year where I would spend some time in the afternoon helping an older child with something like essay writing or a study guide for science or something like that as my kids got to be um, teenagers and <clears throat> doing high school stuff. So uh, when I started doing this workshop, I had several times people ask me if they, for this segment of it, if, you know, do you have something I could take away? Like do you have a printout or do you have a little book or something like that? on dictation. So when I finally had enough time, my old kids were old enough that I could actually write a book. That was the first one I did a couple years ago. Wrote the little booklet on dictation so that people could come to this workshop and take it home. So one would have to beg the question, uh, why don't you just say, here, this is a really good book, you should buy it, uh, and not talk about dictation for an hour. <laughs> uh, the reason why I don't do that is because I think dictation was so fundamental to the way that I approached all other learning and all other subject areas that it's worth spending 45 minutes or an hour on if you want the book you can still take it home for reminders but um, I just think it's way too important to to kind of brush it off as just just read the book so ultimately what dictation is is one person saying something aloud and another person taking it down in some way okay so that might be a boss to a secretary who's taking something down in shorthand or she's typing something out in the context of education, usually we would consider dictation something where somebody's reading something to the child and they're writing it out, okay? Uh, copy work is different than dictation. So copy work, they're actually looking at the sample and they're writing it out. Um, there might be some a placeholder for that. It's not really what we do because I feel like dictation is so valuable that it would cover what you could learn in copy work and so much more that it's worth the five to ten minutes that I'm going to spend on every dictation lesson. So when I learned dictation, I originally learned about dictation through this book, The Three R's by Ruth Beecher, which is kind of a homeschool classic. So she talks about writing, math, and language, and talks about dictation as a teaching tool for reading and language. Uh, the way that she presents dictation is different than how I ended up doing it, but a lot of the skills I learned was through that book, and it's a really valuable book, even though my dictation is going to look a little different. So basically what she was saying was you dictate a passage to the child, and I'll describe more what that means later as we go along in this. Uh, dictate a passage to the child, and then go through and circle everything that is an error. And then the next day, go through the passage again so that they can correct the errors, all right? It struck me a little bit that doing that would be kind of the same thing as doing 30 multiplication questions every day, which is what I did in school. We had our little worksheet of 30 multiplication or addition facts, and you would get some of them wrong, half of them, 10 of them, whatever amount you got wrong, but you would get the same ones wrong over and over again because you couldn't remember what was the right answer and what was the wrong answer because you'd written the wrong da answer down so many times. And I thought, I think there could be some value in just helping the child do it correctly the first time. And as it turns out, that method worked really well and laid the foundation for many other things that I ended up doing. So, so in my world, what happens is I read a passage of prose or a passage from a poem, a nursery rhyme, whatever we choose, and I'll talk about choosing materials in a bit, slowly enough and with enough help that they do it correct the first time. Okay, so the, the teaching is built in. There's passive teaching. Every single thing you tell them to write down, that's a pH, <coughs> that's an O, that has a silent E on the end, you're passively teaching them, all right? But you're gonna draw out one or two or maybe maximum three little lessons out of each dictation that you actually make an active lesson. So you're teaching everything passively, but you're gonna pull a couple of things out actively, for example, you know, using a period. So we put a dot at the end, that's a period. Then on my side of the page, I'm using a little exercise book just like this. They're doing their dictation here. 
I'm making any little lessons that I'm pulling out of it here. Now I just do this on the fly. It's something that I do because there's a kabillion lessons, exactly one kabillion lessons, that I could pull out of any dictation passage. And I write my little active lesson over here. So I draw a dot, that's a period, that shows that the sentence is over. Okay, I might do that 10 days in a row, I might do it once a week, I might do it whenever I think about it, but eventually, drip, 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 after 10 or 12 years of homeschooling, they're going to know that there's a period that goes there. And it's just going to happen, just like the baseball, it's just going to happen, you know, because you spend all that time going over it and over it and all of the other aspects of language as well. So I want to run through, first of all, the benefits of dictation and why it has worked so well. So first of all, it's just really wholesome and simple. You have a pencil, you have an exercise book, you have something you're reading out of, and you have your mom, right? Very simple, very wholesome. It builds really good habits because you're only going to have that child beside you for as long as they can reasonably attend. So for some children, that might be 30 seconds. For some children, it might be a minute. Maybe you're gonna go five minutes. 10 would be an absolute maximum, even with an older child. I would rarely go beyond 10. Um, it builds a, a habit of them attending near you for what they're capable of, and then you can build on that. So you start with 30 seconds. Maybe you build up to 40 seconds. Then sure enough, next year, wow, they can sit for a whole minute. Two minutes, five minutes, look at that. They're asking if they can do it longer now. But you're teaching them to attend. But more importantly than teaching your child to attend, you're teaching yourself to attend. We Culturally, we live in a society that does not attend very well. So if we can teach ourselves that this, this is really important right now, we're just going to pull it all in, we're just going to pull it all together for right now, you're teaching yourself a habit that is invaluable. It's perfectly tailored to every stage and every skill set and skill level that a child has, which rarely is the skill set set out in a curriculum for the average child because it's not the way children learn. And I'll give you an example of that. My oldest daughter was an extremely early reader. She could read at three. By the time we started homeschooling, she was almost five. And she was a fluent reader. She could read novels at this point. So, but she had uh, quite poor, sort of, um, I would say a little bit um, slow motor skills because her brain was, you know, leaping ahead, doing amazing things. And often the, it's one or the other, right? They don't often go together in some nice, neat course. So she, her fine motor skills were a bit behind, I would say. And we sat down to do dictation and I had to do short dictations because it would, you know, make her hands sore. She could only handle making a certain amount of letters because she was learning how to develop her, her fine motor skills. But what I was able to do while developing her fine motor skills on just how to make letters, she knew the letters, she knew the sounds, I could work on things like punctuation. I could work on things like grammar. I could work on parts of speech. Things that normally the average child in the workbook that doesn't exist would have, you know, you'd be doing um, very, you know, sort of pre-dictation skills, kind of pre writing skills, you'd be practicing shapes, practicing letters, but you would not also be talking about punctuation at the same time, all right, because those two skills are quite uh, diverse, but they do exist in, you know, the same human being frequently. Um, my second daughter came along, <coughs> by the time she was five, she read on uh, kind of average around seven, uh, she was, her fine motor skills were terrific, she could write a whole page of dictation in five minutes, but she couldn't actually read yet. So what was I doing with her? As we're moving along, I'm spelling things out, I'm teaching her what? How to read, yeah, phonics. Okay, she's learning that as we go. This letter, this is how it looks. Oh, she can make that perfectly. And it says P, right? And this says A, and this says T. So, you know, I'm teaching really diverse skills in the same kind. I could use the same passage even, it wouldn't matter, right? I'm teaching the same skills uh, the, that exist in one person because that is how we are. We tend to be stronger in something and weaker in something, yes. How do you teach a child who can't read how to write the word they can't read? They're, you're giving them one letter at a time. So and if they don't know how to make the letter, you're helping them make the letter. So you're, you're scaling it right back to exactly uh, what they need, whether that's one letter, one sound at a time, or a whole series of words at a time. So would you like say the passage and then spell it out, or would mm -hmm. you just spell out each individual word? Or? I'd spell out each individual word. Uh, but I would usually read the passage first. Whatever we're going to do for dictation that day, I would usually read the passage first. So if you're spelling it out word, or letter by letter, just short, like two sentences or something? 
Usually, yeah. And I'll talk about different levels in a moment, what, what you'd be doing with a pre-reader, an early reader, a later reader, uh, in a few minutes more, so you get a, a better feel for it, yeah. Uh, so, so it's perfectly tailored. So, like, what, that's what I found the most beautiful thing, is that it really goes with that, um, like, you know, Vygotsky teaches that zone of proximal development in... In, like in education we have to that was like this huge theorist that teaches that you just teach what will be a happy a happy challenge so not so challenging that they're going to cry frustrate not yeah. so easy that it's boring <clears throat> yeah but just that perfect place so if it has to be you know if the zone is just learning how to form a letter or whatever yeah and so you know that's exactly what you're doing with each kid with each aspect of language because it's not just about the letters right? <coughs> language is a is a whole thing so you're doing that with all those aspects of language um, you're engaging all of their senses okay not all of their senses you're engaging most of their senses so you're saying it they're writing it they're seeing it you're talking about it right so it's it's engaging a lot so that they're you know the, ch the child who's tactile or the child who's you know more cerebral or whatever they're you're addressing it from all the different angles so they're going to get it right in whatever uh, time frame they need to get it. So it is passive and active, but it is not the quiz test model. It's just modeling. Passively, I'm telling you everything. You know, this is how you make a P. Um, you need to write down the word pat. Can you do that by yourself? You know, do you know what letters you need to write? And then I'm pulling out active things as well, but it's always modeling. So whatever active lesson I make, it's still a modeling. Every passive thing I say is still modeling. There's no quiz test involved in it. It builds incredibly strong language skills and it builds them in two different ways. First of all, you're taking language and you're putting it under a microscope. Okay, you are the microscope. You're looking at it and you're looking at the mechanics of language, how language is made, how language is built, how it all works together, um, how we even acquire it really is, is, is part of it because they're acquiring it through dictation often. But we're also taking language and looking at it through a telescope. Okay, so we're backing way, way up and we're looking at the purpose and beauty of language in the same lesson. So, you know, the purpose and beauty of language is, of course, something that is going to be, as they get older, you're going to pull back farther. You still have your telescope moments when they're little, where sometimes you just talk about a line of poetry. Like, wow, how does that make you feel? You know, but as they get older, we're going to address uh, the telescope aspect of language, the macro version of learning language. Um, in a much more profound way and they become super literate people because they not only have the mechanics of language really detailed mechanics of language they have the the purpose and beauty of language all being presented to them as a whole thing this is one whole thing if your children are super literate isn't that a great word <laughs> super literate um, they are going to be able to teach themselves anything okay they will they can learn how to wire their house they can learn how to fix a toilet. They can learn how to do quantum physics. If they're super literate, they can teach themselves anything. Uh, so I'm going to run through the list of things. This is not a complete list, but it's a pretty good start on all of the possible things that you can use dictation for. So I'm starting from younger kids, working up to older kids and the kinds of things we've used it for. So learning to attend, letter sounds, letter formation, Neatness, simple punctuation and capitalization, phonics, spelling rules, spelling anomalies, rhyming, sentence structure, parts of speech, grammar, prefixes, suffixes, and root words, complex punctuation and capitalization, author and poet biographical information, diction, vocabulary, pronunciation, cursive writing, memorization, literary terms, poetry, types of poetry, poetry terms, rhyme, rhythm, and meter, Poetry and literary analysis, speech arts, poetry and prose recitation, dramatic monologue, prepared speeches, exploration of ideas, referencing scripture, using referencing using reference books, including atlases, encyclopedias, and dictionaries, and research skills. And we have done all of those in five to ten minutes a day of dictation for ten or twelve years. <laughs> so it never had to be something separate. All of those things were never separate. We never had a grammar book. We never had a you know. Um, parts of speech book, we never had a, a lesson on how to use a map, use an encyclopedia, all of that was incorporated in what we do. <clears throat> so what does it look like? 
it looks very cozy, all right? We're sitting here at a table. I, I do my one-on-one -on -one work in that little kitchen window there. Um, and I usually have my arm on the back of their chair or my arm around them. We're very cozy. I happen to be left-handed, so I can write on this side of the page, and they're writing on this side of the page, but you could be cozy this way, too, if, you're, if you were opposite. Um, so it's very cozy. Everything we need is going to be nearby. I do not want to be hopping up in the middle. You know, we sit down to do dictation. Okay, it's your turn. Come and do dictation now. That, oh, darn, no pencils, no erasers. Oh, darn, where'd your book go? Oh, darn, where's that thing we were reading from? I don't want to have to do that. So I want to make sure that I have a toddler-proof place to put things and that that's where they always stay. Okay, so usually that would be a high bookshelf. Some, for some people, it would be a kitchen cupboard and a... Uh, dish pan that they could put all the books in and put them up somewhere if you were short on uh, shelf space. But <coughs> I would always have a place where the pencils were and the pens were and um, you know our resource book, whatever we were using to use to practice dictation with, uh, would all be right there. And that's something that I would check before I went to bed at night just to make sure everything was where it needed to be so that when I sit down with my kids, I'm capitalizing on the absolute most I can in those five to ten minutes, right? So I'm going to go through a passage, I'll read it out to you first, what it might look like with a pre-reader, what it might look like with an early reader, an older reader, mm -hmm. and bear in mind as I'm going through this, there's really limitless levels, like I was describing before with the two sort of kids on the opposite end of the spectrum, there are kind of limitless levels of how this might look, but I'm just going to give you some examples so that you get a bit of a picture of how it goes. So, I am looking for someone to share in an adventure that I am arranging, and it's very difficult to find anyone. I should think so in these parts. We are quite plain folk and have no use for adventures. Nasty, disturbing, uncomfortable things make you late for dinner. Source that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, so I have a pre-reader. Obviously, that's far too long of a passage for most pre-readers. Now, my daughter Lucy, she probably could have written that all in one day because her fine motor skills were so good, but it would have been a lot to even, um, even for her. And... I can probably make a really good lesson for her, maybe just with one sentence or two sentences out of that. But say for a pre-reader, uh, maybe they're just learning their letters, they know some, they don't know some, and I might say, okay, the first, the first word is I, and then the, the sentence goes, I am looking for someone to share in an adventure. Do you want to just pick out your favorite word out of this whole passage, or would you like to do a bit of this passage over a few days? And they said, uh, they might say they would like to do it over a few days and we proceed to do it all. Or I might, uh, they might say, oh, I like nasty. And so I say, okay, let's do nasty. Do you know what, do you know what makes the n sound in nasty? Ah, uh, no. Okay, well, it's an N. So maybe I'd even do dots and they, they go right over top of the dots. Or if they know what an N looks like, then I'm going to let them do that on their own. Do you know what makes the ah sound? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what makes this sound? They almost always know S. <laughs> yes, because it's a snake sound. Um, and then T, and then Y. Do you want to just do one, one more word or just want to stop there? No, that's good. Right? So I might have drawn out how to make a particular letter. I might have said, look at this Y on the end of nasty. It says E. That's funny, don't you think? Right? A Y says E, but Y says E sometimes. That's all. That's an active lesson. Right? I might write down three or four more words that all say E on the end. You know, um, funny, look, another Y says E. Isn't that funny? You know, so I'm, I'm going to go through like this with them. So uh, I could use any part of this, any word of it. I could use, I could say, make you late for dinner. We could do that in two days, maybe, or one day. And then say, there's an exclamation mark at the end, and this is a cool mark. Do you know what an exclamation mark is? No. Look at this. You do a line and a dot, and that means, Wow. That means something kind of exciting. You're exclaiming something. Exclaiming means you said it kind of in a really intense way, either excited or happy or frustrated even, but it's intense. It intensifies what you're saying. Oh, okay. That's it. That's all I need to do. With a little bit older reader, so maybe somebody who can read a lot of things, but not everything, uh, I might say, okay, we're going to do this passage. Uh, usually for my kids, I let them choose what they want. So I'm not usually saying this is what we're doing. They're choosing something and, uh, and bringing it to the table so that I can do it with them. So, okay, well, let's take two or three days and do this. So um, I, do you remember what you do with an I when it's you're talking about yourself? No, I don't remember. Okay, well, it's always capitalized. We always capitalize an I, so I make that my lesson. It doesn't matter if it's at the beginning of a sentence or the middle of a sentence. We always capitalize the I. Oh, okay. 
So I, and you make it capital, M, can you spell it? Yeah. Looking, can you spell that? Uh, I'll try. So some kids, I have to make a note here about eraser phobes. Some kids are eraser phobes. So don't have them erase anything. Have them say it out loud to you and then um, actually write it out if they said it out loud correctly. If they're the kind of child who's not an eraser phobe, then you can get them to try it and they might have to erase it and rewrite it. You know, but you're going to do it in that moment, right? Like, oh, pretty good guess, but it's actually ING, you know, not just NG. So um, Mary was an eraser phobe. Do you remember those days? <laughs> uh, but some, some of my kids love to just try, yeah. Um, my kid, I, I have a couple of kids who are nervous about erasing, but sometimes we do dictation on the whiteboard for that. Yeah. And uh, and then they don't mind it at all because the letter they could go, I could rub it up on the page and that bit, it's good. <laughs> yes, a whiteboard could totally be a tool that we use. Absolutely. Yeah, a kid that was super sensitive to any correction. Uh, I would no, no. I would just continue feeding them as opposed to correcting them. So you write down an L, then you write down an O. Eventually, they're going to grow out of that, right? Oh, okay. Yeah. Did you, sorry, did you ask something? Oh, sorry, no. no okay. Um, yeah, so feed them if you know that it's, you know, you want to avoid the meltdown, right? And sometimes like they happen anyway, but wrong. what's that? You don't like being anything wrong. Yeah, so, you know, and it is something that kids generally outgrow. Okay. But, you know, so just feed them, okay. you know, and then they know that it's, it can be right every single time. Uh, so I'm going to continue going through the passage that way. I might draw out capitalization. I might say, oh, look at this word, someone. Okay, do you know how to spell someone? Do you think it's one word or two words? Uh, I think it's two words, someone. Well, it's actually a compound word. So then I might say, so let bring that out. I write someone on my side of the page and say that's a compound word where you put two words together to make one word. Isn't that cool? And uh, here's a couple of other examples. Can you think of any other examples of compound words? So that I'm showing them, uh, you know, maybe two or three examples. That's my active lesson. That's all it is. Uh, and then I continue on with the passage and pull out uh, whatever else I see sort of that would be um, appropriate. Okay, look, can you find another compound word even in this passage? Look, there's anyone. That's cool. Anyone. Put them together. Anyone. And, you know, we could talk about if they were old enough, I'd usually talk about the author. Okay, do you know anything about Tolkien? Do you know what he wrote? I would probably use the pa a passage from The Hobbit if we were actually reading The Hobbit. Now, if they were real Hobbit buff, then I might pull it out. But often I would use, use dictation passages contextually. Do you want me to use something from a book or do you want to pick something from a poem? How about the book we're reading? Sometimes I would even uh, pick something from the next chapter that was sort of a... Uh, gave some kind of a clue that about what, something that was happening, so they'd be, you know, excited to like, oh, what's going to happen, you know? So we'd pick something out um, that they could use. So with an older reader, I'm going to give them several words at a time. Okay, so I'm going to read the whole passage first again. Uh, I'm going to ask them after the passage is done. I'm going to reread it to them and say, you try and guess the punctuation. Punctuation is hugely subjective. Right. And so where they used a dash, they might have put a comma where they used um, a semicolon. You know, they might have used a comma and a dash at the end of, you know, the whatever clause was there or whatever. They, there's lots of different ways you can approach punctuation. You don't have to try and guess because it's in front of you. You're using a passage out of a book and all the punctuation is in there. But it's a great opportunity to talk to the child about how it might have been written. So, yeah, actually, that wasn't an exclamation mark. That was just a period there. Well, if I was writing it. I would make it an exclamation mark. I think that's pretty important. You know, why do you think he chose a period instead of an ex exclamation mark? Why do you think he put a comma there when he could have ended the sentence and made a new sentence? Or why does he have that short sentence and he didn't attach it to another sentence? Why did the author do that? So it's a great opportunity to discuss the purpose of punctuation, why we use it, where we use it, and why this particular author used it his way. <coughs> so that's going to be definitely something we... Can I ask you a question for yeah. that? Basic question, what, do you, what kind of resource do you use? I'll be getting into that in a moment. So the question was, I'm just saying this for the <laughs> film, is what resources do I use? So in a couple of minutes, I'll go through some great resources. Yeah. Um, so I'm also going to talk with us, or I'm on middle readers here. So with the middle reader, I also might say, let's look up something about Tolkien. Let's find out where he lived. Let's find out uh, when he wrote this. You know, I'm not going to belabor the thing. I'm not going to ask them to write an essay on Tolkien, but I just want to... Um, increase their world knowledge, right? Increase their uh, their their literacy of literature. 
by saying these things and you know dropping these things from time to time and pulling them out when I can. With an older reader, we're going to do the whole passage a few words at a time. I am looking for someone, so they, I'm going to assume that they can probably get all of that, to share in an adventure. Mm. Can't remember how to spell adventure. Do you, is that a word you can spell? Uh, yeah, I think so. Do you want to say it out loud? If there are no racer folk, or you want to say it out loud to me first? Um, yeah, so maybe they put a ch instead of the t because it has that ch sound, adventure. And I then can say to them, um, actually, that's a t, so why don't you write it down? Um, a d v e n t u r e. Um, and I might pull out some words then. Okay, if that's an active lesson, how to spell adventure, I might pull out a couple of words where a T or another letter slides into another sound. Like it, it is a T, but we often say it a CH or a CH when it's a T or a C or some other letter and we slide it. Why don't we say adventure? Why don't we say that? Well, some people might. But what we say is adventure. So I could pull out some other words where that's, um, that's a possibility to sh just so show some spelling ideas. Okay, so this is something, you, this doesn't actually follow the spelling rules. So that's something you're going to have to remember. You know, so let's write adventure down and a few other words that maybe do the same thing, has a T that slides into a, a CH. But also, uh, for diction, you could say, okay, well, we actually are supposed to say that with a T or a D sound, like children, right? Kids often say children. Adults often say children. It's children. So when you're doing speech arts with kids, that's something that you pull out. So yeah, look at it. It's actually, it's actually children. It's a D. And we say children. When we say children, we're saying it incorrectly. So that helps you with your diction, but also your spelling. Uh, so I'm going to continue on. With this child, I might say, show me on a map. Let's look up where Tolkien lived. Okay, let's get the atlas out. Okay, let's look up where he lived. What was he getting at? What was he, uh, what, what happened after this passage? Okay, what, what was he setting up? He was setting up a scene here. What happened after and why do you think he wanted this particular conversation to happen? He's, he's taking us somewhere. Where's he taking us? So we're going to have a lot more conversation with an older child, you know, high school or grade seven, you know, an older child about the why of literature. What, why does it make a difference? What is the reader trying to do? What are we trying to accomplish here? And everything else in between. So we're working on mastery. So everything we teach the child, the goal is that eventually they will master it. You could go that ab about that very systematically. You know, for the next three months, we're going to work on punctuation. And you always, every passage you have is going to, every passage you ever choose is going to have some punctuation in it. So you're just going to pull out your punctuation and really systematically look at that and uh, work with that and, and teach the child that directly. Or you can do it non-systematically, which is what I've always done, is I just pull out whatever happens and eventually they learn it. It's just a little more organic. It's not one way is not right or wrong. I think it's more fun to just do it on the fly, but it's not, it's not fun for everybody. Okay, so some people would really prefer, no, this year we really need to focus on punctuation and capitalization. And that's what we're going to use in dictation. Doesn't mean you can't uh, talk about other things. Doesn't mean you can't use great learning opportunities as they arise. Um, you know, a word a child doesn't know or a, a word that's more difficult to spell. Uh, but if you feel more comfortable setting it out systematically, then, then that's probably a better system for you. Uh, we teach passively, we, active, we teach actively, and then we cue them. The things that we know, they probably know. Okay, are they going to remember? We would cue them. Okay, that's the end of a sentence. Yeah? So something happens. What? <laughs> okay, they don't know yet. Okay, they're probably going to have to do that for a while longer, or you're going to have to focus on it for a while. <coughs> Um, well, we put a dot there. Oh, we do? Yes, we've been doing this for three years. We put a dot there, and it means that the sentence is over. Oh, like, oh, yeah. But you need to maybe pull it out actively a few times then. If you, you know, presume they should know this by now, um, that you might need to focus on it a little bit so they, they get the idea a little more clearly, uh, a little more overtly. So uh, where are we? So you're dripping on them all the time, and you're backing away all the time to see, you know, where they're at. Will they remember this thing? Okay, this is the beginning of a sentence, so what do we do? We capitalize. Great. Okay, so we don't, we've got that. And they've got it for the rest of their life. Okay, when they know, as soon as you ask them, when they know they've got it for the rest of their life, it's not like, okay, I know it today and I don't know it tomorrow, as in a quiz test model like spelling, 
you know, you present, you can, kids can get a perfect score in a spelling test. The next week they can't spell the words, right? They're studying this out of context. Okay. And so they might, they might have the kind of brain that can take that and absorb it and if it matters to them and all of that. They might learn uh, how to spell via a spelling test, but if they're learning something contextually and they know it, you say, what do I do here? Boom. They have the answer. It's there. Okay. You don't have to revisit it. You know, they're going to know all the time. Um, your tone here is vital. This is the opportunity you have to fill your child's tank and teach them at the same time. Often we approach teaching where I'm teaching you now, I'm teaching you now, I'm teaching you now, and now we're all in a big mess, and now I have to fill your tank again. So let's read and do something nice, okay? You don't have to do that. You can do them at the same time, and that's the beauty of this kind of teaching is that you're filling their tank at the same time, but you have to remember to be nice, okay? And if you only have five minutes of nice, this is the time to use it. I'm going to sit down with my child and be nice for five minutes. And you can set that goal for yourself. I can be nice for five minutes. Okay? And if you can't, don't do dictation. If you're having a really crappy day, don't do it. Okay? If you can't be nice for five minutes. But you... you... Okay, so this is a new sentence. And when they saw it, They made known Do you want to do the next line in cursive? Um, sure. Okay. The saying which had been told them so which is going to have a, right. one of the question words so we're going to have a which beside which had been told them There we go. Concerning this child. So an M has three bumps. is going to go straight into the H like this, see? It's going to go like this and go right into the H like that, yeah. And all who heard it wondered. Do you see what you did? Wonder, heard. 
<laughs> so you have an E R E R D. So it's just E D. Yeah, wonder E D. Everything is so confusing when it's only for so. I wondered at what the shepherds told them. Can you see that again? Yeah. Okay, so you scoop, scoop, look, and then the W starts to go like this and goes straight into an H. It's actually what the, oh. what the shepherds told them. Not an eraser bumper. No. Well, shepherds? Can I use an eraser? Of course. Mm. Nice. Top them. Right? So we do a great. Not a girl. Perfect. That's it.